Sassy Expert um, from the Sugar Science is a new style of scientific communication. It's a brief, informative, and lively discussion with experts in the type 1 diabetes and related uh, interdisciplinary research. We're recording this event. We're going to post it on the Sugar Science site YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. If you have questions for our guests, feel free to enter them at any point in the chat or at the end of the presentation. We'll have time for questions. So today we have at our, um, as our two guests, Drs. Uh, John Glass and Yo Suzuki from the J. Craig Vetner um, Institute down in La Jolla. And uh, thank you both for joining us today. I wondered if you might just give a quick, each of you, a quick thumbnail sketch of your, uh, your careers. So um, like many type one diabetes researchers, I'm one of them, um, but I, I started out in virology and then moved to bacterial genomics. Uh, I spent five years in infectious disease research at the pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly. Mm -hmm. And then um, Lilly decided they were getting out of infectious diseases research. And I was hired by Craig Venter for an organization that was, whose ambition was to build the first bacterium with a synthetic genome. And I've been at the JCVI for the last 18 years and have a wide variety of projects. Uh, our minimal cell project, the project we're gonna to talk to you today about with diabetes, projects to engineer the human genome with human artificial chromosomes and projects to improve the production of vaccines using this technology that Yo and I have been using for a decade or more now in, in, in his case and two decades in mine of synthetic biology, which I think is changing how we view biology in general. Yo? Uh, I'm, Yo yeah. I'm Yo Suzuki. I'm an assistant professor at J. Craig Venter Institute. Uh, we're in, yeah, John and I are in the same group, synthetic biology group. I've been interested in uh, how multiple genes work together, and I'm being interested in complex systems and uh, uh, systematic characterization of complex systems. So we're, I'm really excited about, you know, how multiple parts come together here for uh, type one um, um, applications. And that's uh, how, I, how, how I got involved here. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you guys for that. I think, um, you know, what I read so far is there that uh, Richard Gallo started sort of, he was a dermatologist at UCSD. He sort of started this uh, or incubated this idea that maybe there was, um, you know, some bacteria that, you know, flow in, uh, in, um, fly under the radar of the immune system in the skin. And then um, Alberto Hayek, uh, another scientist down in uh, your area asked, you know, um, you, uh, Dr. Glass to re-engineer these uh, maybe some, some cells to act like beta cells. And then sort of from there, the idea grew, but you know, maybe you got, maybe you can, um, you know, kind of expand, expand on that story. Sure. Yo, why don't we go with the slides just to okay. help, help me make, explain this a little better. Perfect. So sure. our, our work is a, is a consortium of Yo and I at the Venter Institute uh, Rich Gallo, who is a dermatologist at UCSD, and um, Drew Endy, who is a, the, the, uh, the, the father, if you will, in many ways of synthetic biology in the, in, in the world, but he runs a biosensor group at Stanford. And then we've also incorporated um, synth, uh, insulin analog developer Michael Weiss from the University of Indiana, and our work yes. is funded by the Larry L. Hildroom Foundation and the Diabetes Research Connection. So, Can you speak our slides? Excuse me? Uh, I just wanted to confirm that you guys can see the slides. Yes, perfect, thank you. So Rich Gallo in 2013 published a paper that everyone knew that there were bacteria. You wanna move along with the slides, Yo? Everyone knew that there were bacteria on the surface of the skin. That was common knowledge, but the deep layers of the skin had been thought to be sterile advanced. And so what Gallo showed is that the very deepest layers of the skin, there were, 
advance the slides a couple, you know, there were bacteria that were in you know, intimate proximity to the, blood, the bloodstream. And this gave us the notion that people have been trying to use stem cells and, and or, or building you know, authentic human beta cells and trying to reintegrate them into, into humans as a way to treat type one diabetes. But those systems still have to deal with the underlying problem, the autoimmune problem that got rid of our beta cells in the first place. And so what we were thinking is we would build these bacteria as in essence, organoids, beta cell like organoids that would populate the skin, sense blood glucose and treat diabetes. The plurality organism in the deep layers of the skin, not, not your palms and groin and soles of your feet, maybe on your face, but the big flat areas of your skin is an organism called Staphylococcus epidermidis. Mm -hmm. And our idea is we're gonna use our synthetic genomics technology to engineer, advanced show, to engineer the genome of the bacterium, keep going, so that we can add genes to the genome, both an insulin analog, uh, glucose sensors to get control of insulin production, and a way to transduce the signal from the glucose sensors to uh, the insulin producer, as well as biosafety switches so that if you ever needed to, you could get rid of this organism really quickly. And also so that if I were to have this organism, say applied to my skin as a cream that contained the bacteria, there would also be a bacterial, a required bacterial metabolite in that, in that cream that would make it so that if I were to shake hands with someone, I wouldn't be transferring this organism to them. And so this was the basic idea. Um, Yo, I'm gonna turn it over to you to explain how you've engineered Staphylococcus epidermidis. Okay. It's fascinating. Well, yeah, as John was saying, yeah. Uh, research for cell replacement therapies has been really exciting to me. But uh, if you look at the studies, you know, the generated beta cells are quite complicated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, can you make pure population? Are they stable? Uh, are they safe? And we thought that maybe bacteria are much simpler, uh, and maybe we can we can contribute something uh, as JCVI. That's uh, you know how we get started on this. As John was saying, um, yeah, there are bacteria in the deep deepest layers of skin. And also, um, so bacteria cannot quite make the native insulin. Um, what's uh, depicted here on the left is uh, uh, pro-insulin. And uh, this needs to be uh, processed to create uh, um, you know, mature, uh, mature insulin molecule. Bacteria cannot do that, but there are, but there is a type of, uh, uh, insulin called single chain insulin. Um, Michael, a scientist na named uh, Michael Weiss has been the um, uh, en en enabler of this. Um, that has much, much shorter uh, uh, peptide uh, stretch to link the alpha and beta, str beta uh, strands. Uh, and then these are short, um, uh, what's called single chain insulin our insulin analogs are as potent as the native insulin. So, and, and bacteria, importantly, can make these. So we can have uh, the bacteria in the right place. And we can also have, we can also make an insulin analog that's as strong as the native, native insulin. And, is, um, um, excuse me for a second, uh, Yo. Is does this uh, single chain insulin? Um, is this on the market currently? Is it used um, clinically? It's yeah. I believe that it's not on market. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, you can make these synthetically, as Michael Weiss is doing, or we can make it in bacteria. And those, and they work um, just as the human 
insulin does. Yeah. I think I'm not sure the efficiency pro- is exactly the same. Yeah. But the, the half life is pro- not the same? Profiles are quite I similar. Don't know the kinetics. Okay. Yeah. So okay, then we, we just have to make make bacterial strains, right? But uh, what I learned um, in the early days is that uh, we cannot introduce DNA constructs to this organism. It, it's a real organism, unlike you know model organisms we we've used for decades. Uh, tools were not there, and then but a breakthrough happened. Yeah, one day uh, I got hundreds of thousands of uh, colonies, and that was a that was the high point of my research career. And then um, next challenge was that we cannot break the cells open to see what changes we made. So these are really hardy cells, and we did sonication, detergent treatment, and all kinds of things, but uh, under the microscope, you still see the, you know, the rigid circular you know, cells. So but, you couldn't um, break them open? Right, we couldn't. But then, wow. yeah, but something John suggested was excellent, using an antibiotic called vancomycin. Oh, yeah. That, you know, that acts on cell wall. And then just a tiny bit of that uh, was enough to open up the cells. Um, you know, there are quite a few. We need to open these up in order to analyze what we have done. Yeah. Exactly. Got to get at the insides for sure. We, we, we're not talking about treating humans with the cells and vancomycin. Right. Okay. <laughs> that would never happen. Yeah. So now, uh, now we have tools. Now we can put DNA, our constructs in, and we can see what, what we did to the cells. And after that point, uh, our research took off and uh, we were able to make the um, uh, single chain insulin construct easily and then put that in. And uh, the bottom graph shows that uh, we see bioactivity from the um, single chain insulin we made in our, in our cells. These are um, made and secreted by our, our skin bacterial cells. Wow, that's pretty cool. And, now, uh, and I, I don't is... know if you're gonna get to this, but I have a question sort of from a cell biology standpoint. Now, obviously, so in typical ba- uh, beta cells, uh, the insulin or uh, pro-insulin and insulin are stored in the granules insulin granules. Do you see that any kind of storage like that inside the bacteria or is it just sort of free? Yeah, there, there might be something there. Uh, when we lyse the cells, uh, so we, we see in the media secreted single chain insulin, but we also uh, see um, signal within the cells uh, with the Western blot. And then there, you actually see a complex. It's uh, some kind of multimer is happening inside. So wow. something similar might be happening, but uh, our our goal really is to not have that uh, right now. We want to secrete smoothly what we make. A point here, Monica, is that in human beta cells or in you know large giant, I think of myself as a prokaryote, in giant <laughs> eukaryotic cells, there is a great, there's a, a very complicated process between sensing elevated blood glucose and going through this cascade of signals before packets of insulin are secreted outside right. of the cells and can exactly. affect blood glucose. Mm-hmm. Bacteria are you know, a hundred times or more much more than that, smaller than eukaryotic cells, a huge surface to volume ratio. So the sensing of glucose would be almost instantly result in transcription and translation of the insulin. So it will be much more rapid than can occur in our cells. Mm 
Yeah. And this is this is what makes us think that this would be a practical way to do this. If you've got all of these cells, you know, distributed all through the skin that are in contact with the bloodstream, in contact with with intracellular fluids, they will very rapidly respond and insulin is is somehow secreted, excreted from the staph epi cells in order to enable any potential therapeutic use. Yeah, it's really interesting. You've really kind of like um, made it um, just a one purpose versus, you know, the beta cell is much more complex, but you really went after sort of the one, the one functionality here. And I think that's really an interesting concept. At, at meetings, physician scientists have said, you know, it will never be fast enough. And I said, you know, you guys weren't, weren't paying enough attention in your microbiology classes. So, you know, just bacteria are so much faster at doing things than eukaryotic cells that this is what makes this process practical without all of the sophisticated insulin storage that occurs in beta cells. Hmm. Okay. Um, this is, yeah. And so what, what's next on the slides? Uh, so this graph is uh, actually an earlier result. And we are, these days we're making maybe 10 times more in spring, but uh, still that's uh, close to a fasting level of uh, insulin and making more insulin in our cells is a, is a you know, is a goal. And uh, so- And, and but, you, know, you should mention the, the that we, the um, human, I mean, the, the mouse adipocyte experiments that showed insulin activity. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's right. I think it's, this, this is the, this yeah. is, isn't it? Or there are multiple ways to test, test for that. Uh, and uh, for example, insulin will result in the uh, differentiation uh, to make adipocytes and our supernate and scan promote that as well. Hmm. Interesting. So on the right in the graph Yo just showed you was using, um, I think it was Humalog. Um, and right. on, the, on the left, you see the different clones, the amount of insulin activity that we're getting in these human adipocyte assays, showing mm -hmm. that, that our cells are producing insulin that, that is doing what we want it to do. And the negative controls are back to, we, where we put bacteria on the adipocytes that don't express any insulin. And so you see there's no activity there. So this, this was a thrilling result for us. Yeah, that no, was really interesting that they're able to do it. Yeah, and although the act activity might be low for our strains, uh, now we have tools to uh, engineer. So we've been testing all, all kinds of constructs to try to increase the uh, single chain insulin levels. And another thing we were able to do is to make our cells a little safer um, so that we can pass them on to other scientists. You know, right now the, level, uh, the activity level is small, but uh, you, you would imagine that uh, uncontrollable expression of insulin will be not good for the no. experimentalists. <laughs> So we were able to knock out a um, gene um, that's um, uh, needed for needed for growth, but uh, this uh, defect can be uh, um, that's the word that uh, the, this defect can be uh, fixed by uh, providing the, a metabolite from outside. Mm. So we have a con now conditional system where. You know, we can grow it when we want to, and when we don't want it, we can kill. And then that made us, um, that made it uh, possible for us to pass on our strengths to our collaborators at UCSD, Rich, Rich Gallows Group. And uh, they were able to apply ourselves, uh, our, you know, strength, our strengths with uh, constructs for instinct inside uh, on my skin. And then they looked at the uh, penetration uh, of, the, uh, of the cells into the mouse skin first. And uh, the 
panel on the left side shows um, um, quanti quantitative PCR result, mm -hmm. showing that uh, through, throughout the dermis layer of the skin, we can detect our cells. And then the, on the right, you see uh, what's called gram staining to, uh, to stain for our cells. And then um, these are small pictures and hard to see, but without applying our cells, you don't see staining. But with uh, applying our cells, we see gram staining, gram stain dots uh, throughout the dermis layer. And here's a blow, blow up of that, um, of one of those photos. And you might be able to see the, the, the dots uh, throughout the skin tissue. So our no, cells no. can actually go in. You're colonizing the subdermal layer, but so this okay. is the, um, and so they rapidly colonize and then how long do they live? What's oh, the yeah. window? Of yeah, ex the excellent time? question. And we're testing that right now. Okay. So like how many, you know, do you have to put this lotion on daily or, you know, every week? And that's really interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see those results. Yeah. I think our collaborator, Rich Gallo, had an uh, impression about the frequency. And uh, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember, but uh, I was uh, in the other week. Oh, maybe a couple of once a week? Yeah, okay. or once every other week or something like that. No, so, and then just to get back to like the application of this, when it's applied to the outer layer of the skin, how long does it take for it to go deep into the, the deeper layers of the skin that access the yeah. blood vessels or vasculature? Yeah, I think it's uh, within, a, within a day. Um, I, yeah, I need to look at, at their protocol, but I think it, it's, um, it's quite quick. This is two days after application. Okay. But we don't know. We don't know exactly how quickly it got there. You just have to sort of track it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And so then what? Then what's next? Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, our ultimate goal. Well, well, my our first goal, I guess, is to have an effect in mice. Uh, so. Uh, for, for me, uh, it's uh, making lots of constructs. But maybe, John, would you like to talk about um, Dr Drew Endy's work? So Drew Endy's team, led by his graduate student, Kaisha Benjamin, uh, the idea is you have a parts module, a, a, a biosensor that will monitor blood glucose. And that will transduce a signal to the single chain insulin generator. And so what we've done, we took Staphylococcus epidermidis cultures and treated them with either 1% glucose, bacterial growth media containing 1% glucose or 0.2% glucose. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at gene transcription in the two different systems. So the production of messenger RNA, and we observed that there are genes for which the increased level of glucose results in a 30-fold increase in the amount of gene synthesis. Wow. And we're going to be doing experiments now to determine, can we use these systems to get us precise control? And you know, once you've got, once you've got a, a set of genes or a set of uh, regulatory systems that would you could put in front of a gene to control its transcription, then we can start altering single bases of the DNA in order to really optimize this for exactly what we need. Because you know, anyone in diabetes science knows that you know, too much insulin is, is in fact way worse than too little insulin. Yeah, correct. Yeah, no, that, it, it does look like um, you're really approaching it from like a systems approach in order to really control this. Um, and the system you know, seems very, kind of amenable to that, right? I mean, that's yeah. what it's like to me. The real issue that we are struggling with now is there may not be enough Staphylococcus epidermidis 
in the skin that are sufficiently metabolically active to do the job. Mm -hmm. Now, we chose Staphylococcus epidermidis because we, we were pretty sure we could genetically manipulate it, and we know it's in the deep layers of the skin. But there is a great deal more bacteria that are closer to the surface of the skin. Organisms called cutie bacterium really line the pores of our skin and are in pretty good contact with the blood system. Now, the reason we didn't go after these to begin with is no one has ever been able to genetically manipulate them. And so at least what we hope to do out of this project is get a proof of concept that if we have staph epi synthesizing insulin wide open in the mouse skin, that it may be possible to lower the blood glucose of the mouse. Right now, we're just putting, putting you know, a, a few million bacteria on a patch on the skin of a, of a mouse that they shave the surface of the skin. But yeah. really, in order to get a, a better assessment of this, it may be necessary, in essence, to, to dunk the mouse in a bacterial solution, uh, which you know, wouldn't be incredibly cruel, I think, and then let it go about its, its, its life. And then- Kind of like a spray tan. Yeah, uh-huh, exactly. Right. Uh, you know, not having done that, but uh, yes. Or um, I, I, I like it though. And then we can see if we can get enough control to, or, or an, enough insulin synthesis to affect blood glucose. Mm -hmm. You know, it would, I mean, it would be sad for the mice, but thrilling if we came in the next day and found they'd all died from hypoglycemia. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then and then the next set of mice, you know, you'll tweak it so that they don't die. <laughs> right. But right. they don't. But but their CGM reading is good. Yes. You know that we have no desire to be cruel to mice. You know, we're going to take no, diabetic. We're going to take diabetic mice and let them live happy lives. Right. Of course. No, I'm you know, I don't want to be, you know, flip about it. But I mean, it is it it is a it's a really interesting um idea and approach and and i don't see anyone else doing it so i think it's i i think it's a it's it's really sort of a frontier approach the idea of engineering the the, the skin microbiome to be honest diabetes is probably not the best place to start because not only do you have to express something but you have to precisely control it there are a number of sort of orphan human diseases that might be better, better targets for this where expression of a small amount of some missing protein might be accomplished. Um, now people have also- uh, Psoriasis like, or something like that. Well, or even something like epidermis bullosa where oh, yeah. the, the, the skin tears off from the absence of Collagen like seven. Yeah. So if you can make bacteria produce something like collagen seven, that might solve this. Um, but but this is where you know I don't have those diseases. I have this one, and so that's what sort of what got me involved with this. Um, you know, twenty five years ago, people said you should go into diabetes research and do something about it. I said, no, nah, you know, it's going to be solved. There'll be you know better systems, and and certainly there are better systems, but. Uh, you know, it didn't, it, it's still a real problem. Yeah, no, it's a definite, you know, 365 days a week management um, situation. So it, although, the, you know, as you said, the tools are better than they were, but um, I do wonder, you know, what is your impression about the gut bacteria? Um, have you guys had any thoughts about those types of bacteria? Um, you know, there's some kind of, you know, when the bacteria disappear from the gut at onset of type one, you know, there's a, a huge change in diversity, decrease in diversity of the microbiome then. I mean, what about reseeding the bacteria there? I mean, I wonder if it would have any impact. I don't know if anyone's really looked at that. But, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, gut microbiome is just too complex. And yeah. uh, that with our engineered organisms uh, or may not be fed enough to- Can't control it. Right. 
Well, would there, could you ever have a patch of, of your organisms or would you, do you have to, you know, a patch full of bacteria that you could apply to the skin or does it have to be the whole body treatment? We'll figure this out. The other thing about, you know, engineering the gut is, you know, it's the same reason we, or insulin can't be taken orally. Mm. Right. So, you know, you, you, you might see the omentum, um, uh, in, in the you know, parenternal space with an organism that was tolerated by the immune system. But the great advantage we have with the skin bacteria is they're in intimate contact with the bloodstream and yeah. the immune system tolerates these organisms very nicely. Even when they mm -hmm. start secreting insulin, it's still okay. Yeah. Well, you know, the autoimmune response in type one diabetics is not to the insulin, it's to the beta cells. Right, mostly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it uh, also offers uh, mega doses of uh, space for us to engineer. And then there, the, the platform is detachable. If you don't want it, we can get rid of it. Whereas, uh, well, if you engineer stem cells, maybe it's harder, harder to get rid of them. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, what comes of this research? I know you know you started testing in mice in January 2021, and then do you think you know you'll be sort of publishing something soon, or how how's that looking? The the group at Stanford is going to be publishing soon because Kaisha wants to graduate about <laughs> their works about um, the glucose regulatory protein or, or the proteins whose expression is regulated by glucose. And as soon as we can demonstrate any reduction in blood glucose with our system, I think that would be, that would be the impetus for the first publication. Yeah, well, that's great. We'll be looking forward to that, not for sure. I, I wonder if there's any questions from the audience? No, just listeners today. Well, that's fine. Well, we're gonna post it. Oh. This is just really amazing. Thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, we all feel that way for, for the scientists who have devoted their lives and livelihoods to this disease. Um, and I would say, you know, um, really interesting. Can't wait to see what this group um, comes up with next. I love the fact that you have such a, um, you know, a great outreach and collaboration to other centers and, you um, we really feel that, you know, this is the, the collaboration is really the key to accelerating the science. So.